Uh, welcome everyone to session 10b. This is on risk assessment and emergency response. Thank you to everyone who's joining us in person today and also those joining us on the live stream. Um, uh, good to see some new faces from uh, this morning and also some returning from our first session. So uh, my name is Jeremy Hollingsworth. I'm a team lead and senior project manager at Jacobs. And I'm, uh, I have a pleasure of being the moderator for this session today. We've got two good sessions and we'll welcome our, our speakers here shortly. Uh, anybody who uh, needs CEUs, please uh, drop them with Geneva Schlepp in the back. She'll make sure and get that uh, stamped for you. And uh, just a reminder, please, if you have a cell phone, to silence it. So, And with that, I've got uh, the pleasure of welcoming, welcoming Dan Irvin, Joe Agris, and excuse me, Murphy Altamil. So Dan is the Executive Vice President of various Inc. He has worked with water and wastewater utilities for over 40 years. He specializes in is oh man, too much smoke last night. He specializes in control system engineering, emergency response planning, and facility design. Uh, Joe's a technical specialist focusing on cybersecurity and infrastructure resilience. He graduated from Idaho State University's Industrial Cybersecurity Engineering Technology Program in May 2022. And Murphy is a control system engineer with West Yost based in the Portland, Oregon area. So please welcome them. Good morning, everyone. So fully half of the technical sessions um, over the last, over these three days are dealing with advancing technology in automation and controls, whether it's AI or big data, or devices with um, IoT capability. There's a tremendous amount of momentum in our sector for um, efficiency, connecting devices, sophisticated controls, advancing the state of the art in, um, in kind of that sector. There are no fewer than five, at least, cybersecurity presentations, which are basically saying that control is risky. That automation is risky. All those devices connected together is risky. That big data is risky. The AI is risky. What do we do? Those don't seem to be very compatible um, ideas or capabilities right now. I like to think that um, the water and wastewater utility sector has kind of had three um, broad eras. So let's call era one up through the 1970s a time when we were perfecting machines to do our jobs, pumps, compressors, digesters, um, chemical injectors. We'll call that era one. Era two from the 1970s till about now was essentially automating all of those devices. It was developing control systems and controls and connecting them together so that they would work more lively and more efficiently. And at the interface of those first two eras, there was quite a bit of messiness. You know, we have now kind of um, standardized on what control systems do and how they interact with their operators and how we repair them, et cetera. But there was a five or a 10 year transition in there that was not quite so um, easy. I'd like to think that today we're beginning era number three. And that is where we're taking the automations, um, which there, and there is so much momentum in the automatic control and automations technology that even if we wanted to, we likely couldn't stop that. We're not going to unwind the clock now on motor control centers being connected to the internet and meters having Wi-Fi capability and us relying on those control systems to make our systems efficient. We can't change that. We also probably can't change the fact that there isn't anything we can do to make those systems completely cyber secure. And regardless of what your IT department or your system integrator has said, if you have comfort that your control system cannot or will not be hacked, I think you're being naive. So instead now, and this is what we're about to introduce, what we'd like this next era to be composed of is instead of relying on the, our ability to make our control systems secure, and I'm not suggesting that we stop trying, right? We should still do everything that we have been doing and more to make those secure. But instead of assuming that they are secure, let's now look downstream of that technology 
to what the control system is connected to, and let's completely reimagine the way that we engineer and operate those systems so that when our control system is compromised, the stuff downstream from it doesn't create a health hazard and it doesn't create an operational problem. Think of it this way. Think of your control system as your car and the hacker as a hitchhiker. When you pick up the hitchhiker and you will pick up the hitchhiker, instead of putting him in the driver's seat, put him in the back seat where he's just a nuisance. So we're gonna introduce a topic. You maybe have heard of it before, maybe not. CCE and CIE, Consequence Driven Cyber Informed Engineering and Cyber Informed Engineering, which are basically the ideas where we're going to look downstream from the control system, look at what our control system is connected to. We're gonna put physical bumpers on those processes so that when our control system is compromised, it does as little damage as possible to what's downstream. Now that's gonna affect how we design infrastructure from now on and how we um, rehab infrastructure and even maybe some capital projects where we go back and redo some of our infrastructure to make it compatible with this as a concept. But specifically what I'm talking about is um, a sodium hydroxide feed pump in Oldsmar that had the capability to inject a hundred times the safe dose of chemical. That would be an example of the outcome of a cyber informed engineering exercise is changing that pump so that if somebody else has control of it, it doesn't create an unsafe situation or compromise other parts of the process. So this is a very deep topic. It's a very advanced topic. We're only gonna have the ability to kind of skim the surface today. And I'm gonna turn the rest of the presentation over to Joe and Murphy who are experts in this, but this is kind of where we're going. Um, I'd like to think this is pretty exciting because we're beginning era number three. And I think that you may find that these are potentially better solutions to the operation and integrity of our systems than a complete and comprehensive concentration on trying to keep the controls and the cyber hygiene environment regulated. So Joe, are you next? Yes. All right, good morning. Uh, I'm just gonna hit it off and we will go. So just real quick learning objectives, we could push past. Just a slide to reference, uh, you know, some of our co colleagues at West Joe's and then a lot of this presentation comes from the folks at Idaho National Lab that put together this uh, cyber informed engineering concept and consequence driven cyber informed engineering. And that's what we're gonna be kind of be talking about as we go along. Presenters and our agenda. Okay, so this proposed governance changes. I don't know if anyone was here for the nine o'clock meeting with Mark McKinney. Oh, there he is, Mark. I will give credit where credit's due. He like this, he gave the, the PhD lecture on this for you know 35, 40 minutes. So luckily with that, I'm gonna push a little bit past this and just reference that, hey, there's proposed governance changes coming within the water sector. Uh, they're happening, be aware of them. You know, we're going to this idea of kind of having a water NERC or the water risk and resilience organization. And that stuff is coming. And what we're gonna talk about is just ways that helping water districts be prepared for that, but kind of like Dan said, not just gadget solution, but kind of uh, holistic solutions. Once again, CISA putting out more controls, not just for the water in a sector, but kind of really kind of as we generate towards just this IT centric thought process and controls and become more advanced and really kind of focus on the IT OT marriage and people thinking like that and having them together. And that's what, as we push forward, you'll kind of see that's the common theme. We're not gonna separate them and we're gonna have people come together and look at the issues, look at the problems and solve them, all the people in the room, not separate. Okay. So that gets to this idea of why cyber physical resilience and it kind of comes, I'm happy to join West Joe's, you know, previously I was in the Marines for 20 years. I was an artillery officer. I was focused on, you know, lethal weapons, you know, blowing things up, things that go boom, things like that. In my last three or four years, I got to work at a joint staff J7 where we're kind of doing planning exercises. And now we're introduced to like smart people, not in the Marines that were like Air Force, Army, and Navy 
you know, guys and girls that were thinking this thing called cyber and what we could do with cyber effects and what we could do with non-lethal, non-kinetic effects. And so at the time, it was some of these challenges for an offensive presentation, you know, way of like, okay, how can we engage a target system? And at the beginning, people were like, you know, Air Force wants to drop bombs, Navy wants to launch tomahawks, you know, Army wants to jump out of airplanes, Marines want to storm the beach. And that's the way the plan was. And then the, go before the general and the general be like, hey, what about cyber? You know, we, you know, it was kind of asked for Stuxnet, you know, there's a lot of gee whiz things happening. How can we throw that in there? And so the big push was we've got to implement cyber at the beginning of the planning process. How do we get all the people in the room in the beginning, work through the problem and where does everything fit? You know, doing a target system analysis, looking at what we're trying to accomplish, what effect we're trying to achieve. So fast forward a couple of years, you know, I become a stay at home dad, try to reinvent myself. I go back to school for industrial cybersecurity and be exposed to some of these principles. And it's really the same thing, but looking at, you know, in a better way or, you know, protecting critical infrastructure. But that same principle, how do we get the right people in the room thinking physical and thinking cyber together? Because you have to get them from the get go, you have to look at the scenario. And just like, um, you know, the keynote speaker I mentioned in my previous presentation, Phyllis Bruner, she mentioned yesterday about how we need to prepare for climate change and everything we do in the water sector, think climate change, having those people, we develop the design, these systems, design them for five or 10 years down the road where we're facing this. My thing is think the same way with cyber, think the same way with cyber informed engineering and get all of those people in the room at the beginning. And if you can't, you know, incorporate them when you can and, and be open to that. Okay, so the evolution of engineering, we looked at, you know, this idea first, analog, we're doing things manual, everything's great, but there's some inefficiencies with that. So we start to introduce SCADA, things become quicker, things become faster, things become better. But now we're at the point where we realize that there are some, some things that maybe aren't so good about it. And that's what we're going to kind of uh, flush through for the rest of the presentation. So a quote from former director of the National Security Agency, they're going to get in, get over it. And just like Dan said, it's, it's going to happen no matter what someone says or what someone tries to sell you. You know, I always look at like, don't gamble, but if you go gamble, people say, hey, the house always wins. There's a lot of big casinos in Las Vegas, right? My philosophy is if you go to D.C. and, you know, you look at CAA headquarters, NSA headquarters, Raytheon, Lockheed, and all the good folks that support them. There's a reason why they have big buildings and operate and have a lot of government. And don't be naive to think that other adversaries have that same type of capabilities. And the thing with cyber, you don't always need that. You could, there's a lot of other capabilities being pushed down. So they're going to get in, get over it. Um, this is from a gentleman who worked, really pioneered the concepts of CIE and CC at Idaho National Lab. You know, his concept of, hey, he's cyber hygiene, it's great, do it, but just be, be realistic. You know, they're still going to get in and be prepared. Uh, it's just going to give you a speed bump. So my caveat this, and we see with water districts is don't think you don't have to do this to do it, but be, be involved that, that there's more to the process. So that gets to this point is we're looking at this engineering concept with cyber together and looking at it kind of holistically that that cyber hygiene isn't going to stop everyone it will help but if you have a determined adversary if your system in and of itself depends on some kind of uh, you know IT solution they're going to be able to find a way around it and how you look at that and how important that is could have significant consequences and that's the other thing, this quote of not everything requires a cyber solution. I think that's what too many people that are looking to kind of look at specific problems from the IT world. What I learned when I went back to, to school with industrial cybersecurity at Idaho State was this idea of like, hey, you don't have to incorporate a cyber thing to defeat a cyber threat. You can implement how you look at the, the whole process, where things are, and think of a smarter solution. Focus on what you need to protect versus kind of blanketly looking at all your endpoints and things like that, you know, because not everything is the same priority. 
you know, what are those critical functions that we have to protect and how are we gonna do that both physically and cyber? So there's two different concepts here and we'll kind of go over them. So cyber informed engineering on the, the left part of the slide in the blue is kind of the overarching concept. And from that, there was consequence driven cyber informed engineering uh, on the other side, which is kind of underneath it and has been developed maybe a little bit quicker in the last couple of years. And we'll kind of go into what both of those are. But for the most part, you could think of cyber informed engineering, best case scenario, you're putting together a new process and you're looking at incorporating, just like uh, Phyllis said, you know, looking at climate change, but we're gonna do it from a cyber perspective an engineering perspective together on how we're gonna look at what we're gonna do you know, how we're gonna provide clean water. CCE kind of takes a look at existing, existing systems that have been around that we have to work with, that we're able to use that process and say, look at your system, what can we fix? What can we tweak? What can we incorporate it to make it safe? Granted, you're not, we're not gonna be able to rebuild the whole thing, but how could we make it a more secure system? So cyber-informed engineering, like I said, even though it's been around for a couple of years, it was developed by Idaho National Labs just in June timeframe, uh, this publication was released by the Department of Energy that kind of captures these principles, but it's still a work in progress. It's not, there's a lot of development that has to be going, and kind of what I like about it is principles to kind of guide you, um, and if you incorporate them, I think it'll kind of lead you to success as far as looking at it in a realistic, holistic way. So some of these principles, there's 12 primary principles uh, for cyber informed engineering. We're not gonna go through all of them or anything like that. Just wanna kind of touch on some of these, the major things, you know, you have some things like design and operations, and then you have some organizational things. And what I do like about this is, like I said, it's like a holistic way of approach, approaching a problem set. And I think that's one of the key things with trying to defend cyber in a physical system like the water sector or energy a sector is you got to have all those different players involved in the process. And then you got to look at it at a, in a holistic manner, looking at everything and looking at what you're trying to do and then protect it from there, not just some kind of blanket solution. We're going to lay on top of it. Um, so the, the first one, consequence focused design, you know, what are the bad things that could happen? Like Dan had mentioned earlier in his example with the Ultimar brief, you know, can systems be designed? Like what's the worst thing that could happen if this system fails, you know? And then from there, be like, okay, what are the engineering controls that we could put in place? So if that system fails, you know, how are we restricting that bad, that horrible thing from happening into making it something that we could perhaps manage, make it an inconvenience, but it's not going to result in deaths, harms, and things like that. That's really the gist of kind of all of these things. Um, you know, they're, they're terms that you've probably heard at different parts of, you know, different briefs here, but I think what this concept does is kind of trying to put them all together and approach them from all that perspective, from an engineering perspective and from a cyber perspective as well. So the CCE process, like I said, is more of kind of like a process, a, a cycle, targeting cycle, planning process to that regard. So what we're looking at here is kind of the first stage of consequence prioritization, kind of looking at, uh, you know, utility owner, what's a bad day? What does a bad day look like for you? And depending on the, the sector, depending on, you know, who it is, it could be, you know, obviously, kind of the easy ones are, hey, we don't want, you know, our uh, chemicals inside the, the water system can result into someone's death. Okay, obviously that's, you know, number one bad day. But then you kind of look at the system, like who do you have to supply water to and where are those, where are those facilities? You know, where are your hospitals? Where are these other facilities that, no kidding, need water at a compressed window and can't, you know, um, they can't go without a couple of weeks of water. And then asking those questions of all everyone involved, because everyone likes to say everyone's important or everything is important, but when you have to allocate resources, you really find out what is important. And the key with this process is find out what's important and that's gonna drive 
you know, the initial go around, knock off the top things, and then it should be, depending on what resources you have, and, uh, you know, go back and try to knock down those other things, but make sure the really bad stuff gets taken off the table. So the way we do that, system of systems analysis, uh, we mentioned of having an asset inventory, and we just want to look at the standard asset inventory, but then we're going to see how all of those things connect to, you know, our, the people that are your consultants, how does it connect to, um, you know, the people that are supplying you services, and kind of going and seeing where all those webs are, and how different things can affect, and from there, kind of turn it over to people that you know, put on their red hat and say, how would I attack this system? What are the attack vectors that are open? And just expose it to people within your system. Be like, hey, you're vulnerable. You know, that engineering technicians workshop, you know, that's a vulnerability point, And this is why it's vulnerable. This is, you know, you've got information in the cloud and they are, you know, you know, for example, they had something with solar winds, you know, a couple of years ago, and they're dealing with a subcontracting workout to, you know, a, uh, you know, your Ukraine that might be attacked and that's a, a attack vector. So that kind of methodology. And then the biggest thing is uh, mitigations and protections. How do we look at all of that and put it together and to try to uh, protect us from doing that, both cyber and in the physical mean. So this, once again, kind of a different way of looking at it to things. And I always just, from an outside perspective that, you know, Phase three, consequence-based targeting. That's like the cool thing. I think that people at INL, they want to say, hey, we're targeting, we're going to do this. But in reality, I think those, you know, one, two, and four are the biggest steps. If you understand what's important, you understand your system, you know, and you're able to understand that next step of what your system touches, and then you can mitigate and protect from that. You know, that third phase, that might be something, you know, at higher Department of Energy, Department of Defense level, we have to worry about. Ideally, we, we should think about it, but I think if you knock out one, two, and four, you'll be in a, a pretty good position. So that's where we get to this critical enabling functions. The critical functions, what you have to deliver. Obviously, for water industry, pretty simple, we want to deliver clean, drinkable water to our population, right? And then depending on where specifically, also like you know, our fire department, do we have water? So for what to fight wildland fires, to fight, you know, fires within the cities. And from there, what are those things that allow those critical functions to happen? And so having that methodology kind of breaks it out. So you could look at where things connect and how they connect and how we could protect them. So the defender, you say the defender's advantage, you know, obviously if you know your system, you know how it operates and you know all the little nuances of it. Now the adversary, they're going to, they're, you know, they're all over the world, potentially. They could be people that work with you or had worked with you a month ago and maybe are a little disgruntled now. Um, so they also potentially know a lot about your system with a lot of open source research and things like that. So that's the thing, but you as a defender, you know the people you have and you kind of know how every, the little nuances of how everything kind of gets put together more than any defense or more than an attacker will know. And you want to keep that obviously protected. Now, unverified trust is, we like to say is that's where the attackers are going to look. You know, they're going to look at the weak points the, you know, you have surface and gaps. The unverified trust is a gap. Hey, that, that consultant that comes in and plugs, you know, and goes into your SCADA system, do you let him or her, you know, plug into it? Are they accessing it remotely? Are you, all of that is unverified trust. You know, you just let, you know, play in SCADA in the cloud. You know, are you asking the tough questions? So what we're saying is you're going to have to probably do all these things. You know, you're going to have them. We're not saying eliminate them, but just understand that don't trust everybody and ask those questions and find out they could be likely attack vectors or weak points, uh, depending on what you're looking at. So the bottom line, um, what we're trying to do is just mitigate it by understanding it. I think that's what this, the whole philosophy of this and the process and the principles and going through that process is no matter what, if you take the time to look at your system, develop your asset inventory, understand how things work, understand how your people systems and IT, how they fit together, 
it gives you a lot better understanding of how you're going to protect it. And then also focus up front on what is a priority and focus your time, resources, and people on those priorities. Okay, so with that, I'm going to take it off to Murphy. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. All right. Now, Joe, talk to us a lot about uh, the CCE, CCE, CIE methodology, but where to start and what does that look like? So over here, we have a diagram. We see, a, you know, engineers design a thing. It gets implemented and built, and then it's handed off to the asset owner to be secured. But what if it, what if it was different? What if it was designed with security in mind, and then it was built with the security features that, we, that were listed and designed, and then it was handed to the asset owner? And really, it starts with a question. Dear engineer, how bad of a day could you have if a malicious actor owns our control system? What's, what's a bad day for your control system or for your utility? <clears throat> One of the things we do is we design to assume breach and if or when, not if. They're going to get in, get over it. And one of the ways that we can address that uh, assumed breach model is by implementing cyber physical protections. Cyber physical protections are, they protect real world assets from cyber threats. So for this example, we have a uh, pressure switch on a pump. So if it starts and it hits it, it's gonna turn off. You can't blow it up as long as it's wired in the right way. Other ways that we address it is making sure that manual operations are included in facilities. We had a client out in California who they had around, I wanna say five skate upgrades in like two or three years. And through those upgrades, they actually realized they had, they had lost manual operation capabilities through those upgrades. And as a result, we got to go back with them and we got to uh, reinstall some of these manual systems. Another uh, dangerous topic is value engineering. Um, not all the uh, capital costs that are removed or that are saved from uh, cutting uh, capabilities are worth it. Sometimes there's really key resilient pieces that aren't well explained that are cut at the end of a project that can really affect the resilience of a, pro a process. And another great way to assess your kind of cyber ready uh, level is by conducting a day without SCADA test. This is an evaluation to see how well a utility can run in manual operations. Uh, there's a few things that you kind of uh, examine while doing this. You look at the uh, system engineering. Is the system designed to run in manual? Can it do it? Personnel, do you have the staff available to run in manual? And for how long? And re regulatory compliance, is it safe for you to operate in manual and for how long? And this engagement, uh, it can look, uh, it has a lot of different uh, forms. Uh, it could be something as simple as a, just a seminar or a workshop with key individuals all the way up into doing drills with operation staff or doing full roll, uh, roll trucks and full scale manual operation. Um, some of the things that we talked about earlier, redefining expectation, that cybersecurity needs to be included at the design level. It can't be, pat it can't be slapped on at the end. That's not how you develop functional engineering solutions. One of the things that Westios is doing is we are working with uh, AWWA to develop CCE for the water sector. This is gonna be a training opportunity for staff members to learn some about the CCE methodology and how to include cyber, cyber informed engineering into your design projects. Other ways that you can uh, implement CCE, CIE, um, so the, the staff awareness training, the Accelerate course, um, performing a day without SCADA exercise, and then assessing your existing systems and the systems that are going to uh, be developed. Uh, Westios and INL, we are also looking for a uh, pilot, an asset owner who is feeling up to the challenge of setting the tone for the industry. And Westios is working on developing a CCE book. It was originally developed for the power sector, correct? I think yes, and then it now it's focused on the water sector. Right. So. All right. And Dan, would you like to finish up? Sure. Let Let me wrap up with um, a story. Um, between West Jost and various, we did over a hundred risk and resiliency assessments over the last couple of years. And as part of those, we would always meet with um, the operating staff and the engineering staff. And a very common question there was, how confident are you in the security of your control systems? And almost without exception, we heard from that group, we're 100% confident. You know, our IT, our IT managers have this under control. Our system integrators have this under control. We've downloaded the latest patches. We've got the latest software. We're secured this way and that way, right? 
I would always follow that up with, and I would generally ask the system operator, okay, got that. Let's just assume you wanted to destroy something in your system. How would you do it? And the funny thing was, is that operator always had an answer. So after just saying, I'm completely confident in the security of my system, he would always know how to break it. And sometimes those were um, not necessarily cyber related. For example, in one instance, we had an operator, and this was a water treatment plant with some very large finished water pumps. And he said, I would simply go on and turn the pumps on and off quickly, you know, and after about four or five rapid restarts, they would, they would burn, you know, they would fail. Well, the CIE, CCE solution in that case might be to put a mechanical timer on that pump that's outside of SCADA that simply doesn't allow the pump to start again until there's been a 10 minute pause or something like that. There's no detriment there to your process. It's a very inexpensive solution. It doesn't require a redesign of your whole process, but what it is, is it's a new way of looking at, and this is now the culmination of all the work that Joe and Murphy were just mentioning. It's a new way of looking at the integration of the control systems and our processes and finding ways to control the process, to put boundaries on the process so that it does a minimum amount of damage when the rest of the system has been unintentionally or intentionally compromised. So um, again, we'd like to think of this as kind of maybe an introduction to this topic. We think you're gonna be hearing much more about that in years to come. Idaho National Labs, which is the federal government's research arm for um, the municipal sector, is um, actively developing standards and processes. In fact, there's even now a program you can take and a certification you can get um, and a programmatic analysis within CCE to examine water and wastewater infrastructure and to certify it for CCE CIE compliance and kind of begin the next era of operation and protections in our industry. And with that, unless you guys have anything to add, I think we're ready for questions. Can you hear? Thank you. So for those online, if you want to ask any questions, please go ahead and type it into the chat. I'll come around to that at the end, but I'll first go around for questions in the room. So it's all one hand. Um, you mentioned at the end there that you're looking to do a uh, pilot uh, assessment. What's that going to look like? What are your goals with that pilot project? You want to answer that, Joe? No, Murphy? Yeah, like, so I think some of the start of the goals of just saying, looking at through, I'm sorry, sorry, put the microphone here, I'll just hit this one. Um, you know, just be able to look at with different water uh, sector utilities going through the process with West Joe Sinel, looking at where exactly in the design phase, how we look at the engineers looking at it through this lens of, uh, you know, as ideally, as you're developing something, a new pump station or something like that, kind of understanding the principles of CIE within your utility, but then also having the engineers look at it through this process as well and walking them through, you know, kind of a train the trainer type thing of, of going through it and, uh, you know, exposing them to it, but then also showing the utility, the value of it as well. And Murphy, do you have anything there? Uh, I was just going to say, so CCE and CIE, they belong to Idaho National Labs and they're focused on the electric sector. So they don't under have a, they don't have a gr uh, great understanding of how the water sector operates. So this is their opportunity to see how their principles are applied in the water sector. The, the assumption is that those principles, what comes out of this process may ultimately become regulatory. So this is something that we should all pay pretty close attention to, by the way. Any other questions in the room? We have just a couple more minutes. All right, let me go check the chat. Oh, we do have one. Um, so from Matthew Nolan, he asked, many modern plants are dependent uh, on SCADA to operate. Are you seeing agencies and engineering firms design for a day without SCADA? Yes. <laughs> so um, we would say we think that's a, an absolutely crucial part of any modern design exercise in any new facility that's conceived and built. Excellent. Let me double check. I don't see any more online. So uh, thank you, Joe, Dan, and Murphy. Great. Thank you. Thank you.